Except, I was going to say, the, the, one, <coughs> the one director whom I certainly was consciously affected by and, in, and influenced by was uh, the British director, Humphrey Jennings, not well known uh, throughout the world and probably not well known in Britain either, uh, since the, the British don't celebrate their own talent. Uh, and he was a documentary director who emerged from the Grierson movement of the 30s, but was never very much approved of by the Griersonians because he was much more an artist than a propagandist. And during the war, he made two uh, quite substantial films and two or three short films, which had um, marvelous poetic quality. They had uh, a human sensibility, which was really remarkable in, in that context, because the, the Grierson Documentary School had very little uh, warmth. I think they were always scared of human beings. Jennings had this great warmth in his wartime films, and also evolved a very subtle, personal, characteristic style based on cutting, juxtaposition, juxtaposition of images, juxtaposition of sound and image, of music, image, natural sound and image, uh, in a kind of patterning that always uh, fascinated me. And um, though I, I don't think I have ever been an intellectual filmmaker in quite the way that Jennings was, uh, Jennings really was an intellectual whose films uh, made outside the emotional climate of war were apt to be a bit cold or theoretical. It was the war that uh, breathed passion into them and gave them life. Um, of course, that's what in Britain we have lacked, and it's very hard to make films in a declining society, uh, a society that has lost faith in itself and where uh, to be emotional is to be suspect. And that's probably one of the reasons why I've always felt that the only way to make a film is to work up feelings of sufficient desperation in oneself to be able to blast through the climate of uh, indifference or coldness that undoubtedly exists uh, in England. Well, the other director, of course, who has been a lifelong a uh, passion of mine ever since I saw my darling Clementine just after the war is John Ford. And um, <clears throat> I don't know whether I would presume to say that Ford had influenced me. Uh, I just have, uh, I, I've admired his work and responded to it, uh, the good work of Ford, so much that I imagine it must have influenced me in some way. Um, but I think the other thing that is really extraordinary about Ford is that he was a director who managed to work happily within the commercial system, sometimes perhaps unhappily, but more or less successfully for God knows how many years, 40 years, uh, 17, 27, 37, 47, 57, more than 40 years, uh, who made very popular films for most of his life, and yet who managed in his best work to preserve a personal feeling, an absolutely subjective uh, feeling about people, about the world, which is as personal, as subjective, and as poetic as any avant-garde film. And this is quite extraordinary. This is very, very rare or unique. Uh, he created a world which was totally his own and recognizably his own. And I think it's that quality that's missing now. I was happy enough, fortunate enough to meet Ford half a dozen times. A very uh, extraordinary, maddening, impossible personality. But however difficult he was, and however, in a sense, badly he behaved, uh, you always felt you were in the presence of a great man, and that doesn't happen very often. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have had my periods of luck. I think at the moment I'm not 
in a particularly lucky period, uh, as if you look at Ford, the last ten years of his career were also not lucky. His luck ran out, and uh, the world in which he was making films and still trying to continue as a filmmaker was not a world that um, he could be sympathetic with or could be really sympathetic to him. Now, you're, the, you're one of the co-founders of a, of a school of modern-day cinema, and uh, what about now, 20 years later, from, I mean, post uh, well, free it's, cinema? I think it's uh, in relation to uh, Britain and British cinema. It's, it's extremely sad because free cinema was a, a, a specifically British movement within the context of the British cinema by uh, a very small number of people, in fact, who were friends and working with very, very limited means at a time, of course, when uh, the, the contemporary adjuncts to filmmaking hadn't been developed. I mean, there wasn't such a thing as tape, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't tape for editing, and there wasn't, uh, you could never a blimped handheld camera, anything of that kind. <clears throat> so that, so that um, and we were people who uh, were interested in movies and wanted to make films at a time when the British cinema was totally congealed and was uh, still absolutely in its pre-war uh, image, resistant to new talent, new ideas, or exploiting new territory, exploring new territory. And uh, we made, um, it really happened, as many things happened in Britain by Chance. I mean, it was an empirical movement that um, I had been working on the film I was telling you about called Together uh, by Lorenzo, which was a 35 millimeter picture. Uh, Carol Rice and Tony Richardson had been making a little 16 millimeter movie about a jazz club called Mama Don't Allow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had in my bottom drawer uh, a little 10 minute documentary, impression, film poem, whatever you like to call it, called O oh Greenland, which I'd made about four years before in, in Margate, at a, a fun fair in Margate. And we were talking about these films, about Together and Mama Don't Allow particularly, and uh, realizing that when you made a movie of this kind, there was absolutely nothing you could do with it. I mean, nobody wanted to see it. There was no way you could show it. it was, they weren't regarded as real films, that's to say they weren't things that critics would ever bother to uh, turn up to review, uh, because critics really work entirely within the establishment. Um, so I suddenly got the idea uh, of forming a movement. Um, but it was a movement after the films had been made, uh, because if we put our films together, and if we found uh, a label for them, and if we wrote uh, propagandist publicity, we could create the idea of a movement which would be journalistically viable and then the, we knew that the journalists would write about it and therefore we would be able to make some kind of mark. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we picked the name Free Cinema and uh, we managed to get the National Film Theatre in London to give us four days and we made this program of uh, together, Mama Don't Lie, by Carol and Tony, and this film that I had made <coughs> about five or six years before, which nobody had ever seen. And uh, that we launched and we made uh, propaganda, uh, we whipped up a certain um, aggressive feeling about the British cinema at the time and played the, the youth theme rather hard. And uh, there was enough, fortunately, in the films to make an impression, get the press, and it was extremely successful. And from then, this uh, movement or series of programs shorter films also that I've done, I'm very conscious of a uh, complete split between um, the sentiment or lyricism, I suppose, of a film like uh, Every Day Except Christmas, uh, or one of my favorites, because it's not a long film, a 20-minute Polish film, Singing Lesson, uh, which are very, uh, what can I say, lyrical, perhaps, and uh, soft. I mean, they're not aggressive at all, 
And in fact, I've constantly been accused by critics of being sentimental on the one hand and cynical on the other. And uh, they can never make the adjustment. And they end up liking neither. But I think that is, I think that the, the other side is present. I would hope it is present in the work. The lyricism. Yeah. Oh, yes, for sure. That's why probably you can get away with being violent and not appearing to be violent, because you do mix it. It's a poetic mixture. Yes. It, it's got something to do also, probably, with the kind of uh, social context one's working in. You know, we, we haven't uh, um, really been in a period where, uh, I don't know, where, shall we say, where tenderness or softness is easy without falling into sentimental very hard. Um, I, it always reminds me of Brecht's poem, uh, where he says, uh, you know, to future generations, yes. please remember us, you know, and don't think too harshly about us. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Mm. I could never it's very, do. it's very good. Yeah, he says, uh, <clears throat> when to when when you look back at us, um, uh, forgive us, because what kind of an age is it that we live in when to talk of a tree is almost a crime? I know it. I, I understand that. But then, of course, I've never felt that to talk of a tree really is a crime. And I have at times got extremely impatient with a certain kind of Marxist who has felt the need to apologize for being an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that there is a, a, a Marxist critic called John Berger who irritated me intensely mm -hmm. <clears throat> at a, um, it was one of those symposia on um, uh, Marxism and the arts or something like that, which I am totally unfitted to attend. And uh, I was sitting on that platform. I knew I had to make a speech. Fortunately, he got up before me and started making one of these uh, apologies for, for talking about art when we were all supposed to be talking about revolution, which is complete rubbish, of course. And that gave me something to get up and be rude about. Um, because I think that uh, that is, is, is purely Philistine. <clears throat> to feel that art is only justified if it is um, if it serves some revolutionary end. I don't believe that at all. And uh, I think that in a certain way, art has to be an end in itself uh, to the artist. Uh, the moment the artist feels that he's using art in order to accomplish something other than, than the creation of work of art, he's liable to be a bad artist. Um, the relevance, I don't mean that art isn't relevant to society or to life, which also it must be to be of any value at all, but that is simply a proof, that's part of the uh, maturity, the capacity, uh, the talent of the artist. This isn't something, it isn't a conscious decision that he wills. If an artist is any good, his work will in the end be socially or humanly relevant. Um, he doesn't have to make that decision. And if he decides to make his art socially relevant, he'll end up making propaganda, which is very boring. Mm. How's that? <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Take two. Yes. Well, you know, uh, thing, tell me when we're being recorded, because I want to say something. Yes, we are. Oh, we are. No, right. Just because I talk doesn't mean anything. Hey, all right. <laughs> now, I think, now, what was I going to say? You said something rather important uh, about changing the world. Wasn't it? Yes, the important thing about the relationship of uh, art and politics, or artists and the politician, is that it can never be uh, of any, uh, it can never be of any value, and it can never be uh, fertile, unless the politician is as prepared to learn from the artist as the artist is supposed to be to learn from the politician. <laughs> but of course, you'll never find that in any, uh, in the program of any um, political party. I mean, the idea that uh, the artist can teach the politician is outlandish. But uh, it, it was Shelley, I think, wasn't it, who called the um, artist the, un the artist, the poet, the unacknowledged legislator of mankind. Well, it's quite true, and of course he does remain totally unacknowledged, particularly by the politicians, who are mostly interested in power anyway. 
yeah, I guess it's a utopian dream to think about artists uh, having influence. But they do. Well, they do, but, but it has to be in a different way. Right. And uh, I think that, personally, that the only safe uh, political philosophy for an artist is uh, uh, anarchism of one kind or another. One may be temperamentally <laughs> conservative or temperamentally revolutionary, but you'd better be an anarchist. Isn't that what isn't that what the title "if" means? If that's the way you want it, then that's the way you'll. Get well, it. <laughs> the title "if" actually is very interestingly ambiguous, which I always like, because the first evocation to say anybody uh, educated in English literature is probably going to be uh, a relationship to the poem by Rudyard Kipling, and that is a poem which is really. And it's rather a good poem about growing up, taking responsibility, ending what is, and which is more, you will be a man, my son. Uh, of course, it being by Kipling, it carries the overtones of the imperial tradition and therefore the public school tradition of if. And then quite apart from the whole Kipling connotation uh, is also the idea, uh, if this is the way we go on, this is the kind of uh, action we will create. So I like to have a lot of meanings all, all um, jostling against each other, and then people can take which meaning they like. Well, the meaning in that film was very clear to me. And, uh, well, that's interesting. You see, that's interesting because I'm, I'm quite sure there are people who will get a different meaning from it, and not necessarily one that's less correct. Well, then it's probably a very good uh, reflection of our society because the people who have some, whose interests are involved probably wouldn't like the film. And uh, it's just that the film speaks for a whole other, well, it speaks for revolution. It speaks for the need for revolution. And uh, well, those images are, are fairly <laughs> clearly drawn. Well, they are. But on the other hand, uh, would you say, just on recollection, that the uh, film ends with uh, a note of success, hope, and achievement, or a note of apprehension and uh, tragedy? I think apprehension is there. I don't believe in tragedy. I think that yeah, at, some, I... at some point, I think the film transcends. Uh, it, it does become art at a certain point, and then you, the meanings are absolutely uh, implicit, yeah. and the images are very clear, and the meanings are inside of me. And it's like, it, it makes me see where I fit. It does. It creates tension, and it, yet it releases me at the same time. It's very interesting. Yes, I, I think and, that's true. And I think it's, in a sense, open-ended. Yes, it is. Uh, and, uh, but it obviously doesn't end with uh, somebody waving a revolutionary banner. Oh, no, 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 no. There are no, uh, there are no winners, let's say. Uh, it, is good. It's, it is good, actually. It is. It's yeah, very good. I mean, yes. it does not say, to, in other words, it becomes a metaphor. It becomes poetry at the end. And that's what you're trying to do. That's what you, definitely what you're trying to this do. That's absolutely right. That's and it, it works. It's interesting yeah, because it, it does seem to me that, I don't know if I'm wrong, and of course one is always formed in a certain period. Perhaps one's, uh, one's response is hardened. But it seems to me that poetry is the quality that is most lacking from uh, films today, from cinema today. Uh, and it's curious. Um, and I think it's what makes uh, present-day films, modern films, on the whole, unsatisfactory. One goes to the movies, you, you want to enjoy yourself, but I don't think it's just nostalgia that makes one feel that the experience of seeing a movie today is, on the whole, much less satisfying than it would, would have been 30 years ago. 40, 50, 60, 70, 40, oh, 40 years ago. 39 was a good year for Hollywood. <laughs> But do you think well, that's true? That, that the poetic, the poetry uh, seems to, yes. Have you seen any good films lately? Well, for instance, I liked, uh, I, I really liked, responded to, and admired Hair. Why? I think, but, but again, well, it may be that in the end I was admiring uh, the great skill, the brilliance, with which it, it tackled that task of making a film of hair and uh, the manipulation of film, I mean, the, the use of film, of cinema, and the uh, direction, Miloš's direction, and also um, the photography by my old friend, 
uh, Miroslav Andrichek. I think it's absolutely brilliant and it's something you really can enjoy when you're watching it. But I'm not sure that the larger comment is there. I'm not sure that at the end... Poetry, you mean? Yes. Well, I mean, at the end of Hair, there is a film that, that when in the end you see the, the grave of the boy who's gone to Vietnam, uh, either you're moved or you're not. And uh, if you're not moved, it becomes a gimmick or it becomes a scriptwriter's solution. And uh, I, I'm not sure how moved. I haven't seen it. I, I guess I'll have to see oh, it. Oh, yes, you really should. It's, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an outstanding film. It's very enjoyable. I, well, can we cut for a minute? What's the one most satisfying thing in your life like, that you... that you... What do you feel satisfied about these days? Oh, I don't know. That's a terrible question. I know um, it. I don't think I know how to answer that. Do you mean uh, in terms of achievement or, or um, um, I don't, and I really don't feel satisfied with anything very much, except um, I do and I don't. I mean, um, <clears throat> there are some pieces of uh, film that I wouldn't object to being screened at my funeral. Like? Well, I think actually, uh, in the end, the, 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 the little piece that I somehow like most is the little film I made in Poland, <clears throat> which is called The Singing Lesson. I don't know why, perhaps because it was most abstracted from everything. I mean, it was to do a film there. Um, one was, I was sort of free, in a way, you know. And it was very enjoyable, of course, working in a context where one was, in a sense, free from anxiety. You know, there are quite enough anxieties in trying to do something well without having like, all the additional anxieties imposed on one. And I think that I enjoyed working in Poland because uh, underneath it, there's a sort of safety net. You knew, well, if it wasn't very good, it didn't matter. Uh, so you just could, were free to work and try and make it good and to make something that existed in terms of pure feeling. And uh, the whole project was so sympathetic and the people I was working um, I think, and, and it was a, a, perhaps also it's a purely, it, it's very lyrical because it's a film that's composed of six uh, songs um, sung by students, acting students in uh, Warsaw, and uh, absolutely purely lyrical since I couldn't really understand the words, so we're in Polish. Uh, well, that's all I can say about that. That was a very nice experience. So they can show that at my funeral. Witam pana Sabina. Pogoda można powiedzieć niezupełna. Cóż, samotność można sobie wypełnić, można czytać. Ach, ja bardzo lubię poezję. Już ciebie kocham. Świat się zmienia. Zakwitasz szczęście od tych słów. I tak jak w pierwszych dniach stworzenia przywleka ślubną szatę znów. I... No nie, no to jest cudowne, prawda, pani Saturninie? Panno Sabino, Panno Sabino, ja nie będę dłużej ukrywał, że właśnie miałem zamiar powiedzieć Pani to samo. Słowem Panno Sabino. Słowem Pani Saturninie. Ach, Panno Sabino. Ach, Panno Sabino. Panno Sabino. No, Panno Sabino, ko, Pana Pupinko Sabinko. No co? 
Chodzi mi o to, żeby pan atakował ją z tym. Ach, pan Nossabino przybliżał się coraz bardziej. No, nie śmiałeś. Proszę jeszcze raz, pani Rydno. Słowem pan Nossabino. Słowem pani Saturni, nie? Ach, pan Nossabino. Ach, pan Nossabino. Pan Nossabino. No, pan Nossabinko, kochana Wilko Sabinko. No co? Ach, i znów od początku pan do Sabino, znów to za mnie. Nie pan Ludziaska, proszę bardzo jeszcze raz. Panie małżonku, już wszystko wiem, już masz pozycję w małżeństwie tej. Nie każdy wie, to zdarza się, nawet w najlepszej pani. Chciałem wam pokazać oryginalne pa okresu fantastycznego. Może pani będzie skawa. Uważajcie, to jest tak. Raz, dwa, trzy. 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 Bo to tak wygląda. Macie więcej miejsca. Proszę bardzo, skrócić się dalej. Raz, dwa, trzy, tak. Dobrze. O! Raz, dwa, trzy. 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 Raz,